Today is July 13th, 2023. My name is Karen Neuror. I'm a librarian at Oklahoma State University, and I'm in the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program Department. But uh, right now I'm in Barnstall, Oklahoma, at Barnstall High School uh, in the Wilma A. Loeb Library and Media Center to interview Miss Wilma Logue, who began teaching at Barnstall High School in 1955. Miss Logue, thank you for having me here today. I appreciate your participation and I, I've been looking forward to learning more about you and your career. So let's start with you telling me a little bit about yourself. I came to Barnstall in 1955 not really knowing what to expect because I was had just recently graduated from the University of Arkansas. I did know the name of the town because uh, a friend of my mother's was had lived here as a child and she had told my mother stories about Barnesdale. Um, and so all my life that name was was in my head some way except we called it Big Heart because at that time that she lived here, it was known as Big Heart, Oklahoma, but later was changed to Barnsdall to uh, reflect uh, the connection with the Barnsdall Oil Company. But in, in 1955, I came into town happy that there were trees here. I don't know what I expected. I visited in Oklahoma all my life because my uncle lived in Tulsa. But I think I thought that when I came north of of Tulsa, I was going to see no no trees, but there were beautiful trees along Bird Creek, and I was happy. I had trees that I could feel like I was still in Arkansas. My my home was Huntsville, Arkansas, and I graduated from high school there. I went all of my years of education in that area. The first five years was a one rooms country school, just not too far from town and just as we might say over there a hoop and a holler from my house where my mother taught school and I went the first five years at that to that one room school and then the consolidation took care of that school and we and the Huntsville schools absorbed it and she taught third grade there until she retired in 1979. So my education before I came to Oklahoma was all Arkansas. It was, I was consumed by what was happening around Huntsville and definitely around the University of Arkansas. I would stand on my knees on a, my grandmother's rocking chair with my ear to the radio on a Saturday and listen to the Arkansas Razorbacks play football. And so I, I make no apologies that I am a Razorback all the way. I am, and my students have had a lot of fun out of that through the years. Some of them wanted to tease almost every day when we came to class something about, oh, you're a Razorback. Uh, some of them brought me gifts. Some are still here in the library on my, on my desk as mementos of the fact that they recognize my love of the Razorbacks. But the interesting and rather ironical outcome of that is that some of the heaviest teasers that I had now live around Fayetteville. Their children and their grandchildren have graduated from the University of Arkansas. And I feel so smug when, that, when I think about, oh yes, all that, you're a Razorback. <laughs> now you are too. <laughs> but, I came expecting to be the librarian in the Barnstall schools and learned very quickly that I would also be teaching some English classes, which was fine with me. And I started out in the basement rooms. There were two, at that time, two rooms in the basement. And I, th I think I thought maybe that was the launching pad, but anyway, for new teachers, they seemed to get put in those two basement rooms. But the end of the first year, they told me I was coming upstairs and that I would be in, in the uh, 
high school, instead of teaching junior high classes of English, I would be the basically head English teacher in the high school. And from there I have, I think I, I guess I want to say I've bloomed into a, a full Barnes doll person. I still love my Arkansas roots and I still love the Razorbacks but I'm all Barnsdale Panthers now. I, I think we have, I thought then we had a good school and someone said to me, a, a friend who was also a teacher said to me, we were small, but we think big. And I found that to be very true. The community had many professional people who some were employed by Phillips Petroleum Company and uh, City Service and other companies, and their children were eager to come to school and to learn. And that made teaching very pleasant for me. And, and it, it really, we've had ups and downs as far as finances are concerned. That always happens in the educational field, I think, but, but I think that the norm has been that the community still thinks big, even though it's small. So I, I'd had good training in writing while I was at the University of Arkansas. I had some of the best teachers for that. And when I came here, that was my goal, was to teach writing. And I found that the norm had been a grammar book and lots of correcting sentences in the grammar book and which had its value but it wasn't writing and so I started my program my undercover mode to change the English department not from the grammar book solely to a place where students could read discuss and then could put down their words on paper so that they, they could share that with someone else who felt the same way they did or could counter them if they disagreed. So that's been my mission and, and I've been very proud of what has happened with, with the English department. And I have also, must also give credit in the area of library media, because when, until about 1983 or 84, somewhere in that time frame, elementary school had only had room libraries, their teachers had gathered together what they wanted to use with their students. And the superintendent said to me one day, what do you think about centralizing our elementary library? Well, I was euphoric. Hmm. That's what I'd been thinking about, but I didn't know I was going to find a, a superintendent who would feel the same way. Uh, so he said, why don't you work on it? And so I gathered some volunteers and working under the, the uh, threat that I had learned under Marcella Grider, you don't pull library books out of teachers' rooms because they won't like you if you do that. It's Grand Aunt Sally's book that she gave me before I started teaching and I don't want to give that up. And I said, okay, we'll, we'll not bother a great Aunt Sally's books. We're going to work from a different angle. So we brought all those books out, leaving what we thought might be precious items for a teacher. And we put them into a room, which is next door to the principal's office. And that was fortuitous because I could work on his good side of I get it, getting him in the mood for a centralized library. We wrote grants. Uh, we uh, used every means we could to improve what we had. And I was able to hire a person who had been a student of mine. And at the time, she was working as a student assistant, in, I mean, as a teacher assistant in the building. And I was able to get her as my library assistant at the elementary school, which was wonderful because she, she didn't have a college degree, but she had a love of books and a love of children. And she marched into that library and 
and it it bloomed. I keep using that word, but it's a good word to describe what happened there. And on weekends, we we went to garage sales. We looked at books. We went to Coffeeville to uh, uh, the sale they had ever so often, and we bought books by the pound. We did everything that we could to bring more books to those students. And building on what we had discovered was a grand collection of books in those in those room libraries. I was amazed that they had bought. It was as if they had had my supervisor, Marcella Greider, looking over them in books and related material when they bought what they had. But, but we, we had something good. And then the day came that we could have some more money by my writing a grant to the Doctors of Hospital Foundation. And we purchased a Morton building, which is still sitting downtown after the old building has been uh, raised and all the pieces of the brick carried away, but that building is still down there as testimony to what Jane J. Vine, I'm gonna give her credit by name because she, she did a wonderful job of pulling together library lessons that children love. They'd say, we love to go to the library. We like because we like it because Miss Javine is so friendly. And they said such nice things about her and and those carried on into high school. They would tell me things when they got to the high school about how much they enjoyed the library. So that I consider one of the highlights of my my years here. And then I've moved my library, my own high school library, I've moved it. 13 times around this building. And I, one day I said, I will not do this anymore. I will not move this library anymore. I'm going out the north door, I'm going home. And then they told me that they were going to include a new library in a, in a bond issue and I changed my mind. Okay, I'll move it one more time. About what year was that? Um, 2000, we actually opened the library here in 2005 but there was a period there where we were a lot of noise and a lot of building and a lot of this and that. And, I, and my library books were stored over in the Student Activities Building in each of their, their sectional trays. We just picked them up and we took them over there. And that made moving back in a lot easier. The, the library went together a lot smoother than it might have otherwise. I, I know that I have more room in some ways, but, but sometimes I feel like I, I had a different configuration in the library I came out of down in, in Hugo Hall. And, and I know I have so much more material now than I had then, I don't know what I would do if I were still down there. But I'm constantly having to add shells and figure out ideas of how I can move something around so a life can be more, uh, it can be easier for students to use and find things. So uh, I've, I'm always going in and presenting the superintendent with one more idea where you have to get the saws out and do something. And, and back in the back of the room there, I, I had the idea I can get rid of those shelves because we don't have standalone computers in here anymore when we don't, we're not planning to have and I can see some shelving in the back of the room that I can move the 398.2s, which is the bane of any librarian's existence. I can move the 398s back there and they'll still be where sixth graders are gonna find them because they love those books. And they'll be, they'll be hitting me first week of school and wanting to just explore that section. So, okay, back there and I can see you while you're at it. But, those are things that that highlight my time here. I I would like to say something again about the fact that I think Barnesville Schools is a good place to teach. And I have some evidence, I think, to prove that, that some of us came and we stayed. And I don't think we would have done that if it had not been what I am, as I am describing it. Um, 
when I came here, there were two teachers who had been here, bef who came before our my time. Andrew Van came in 1953, and he stayed 34 years before he retired. Joe Gilbert, the famed basketball coach who's had lots of, of publicity in the, in the athletic area, sports world, he came in 1954 and stayed for 36 years. Um, Bob Baker came one year after I did, and he stayed 38 years before he retired from the elementary principal's position. And I'm still here, and this is my six, beginning 68th year in, in August. I, I don't know that I could foresee that in 1955-56. I, I think I knew that I would stay one year if, I mean, if they wanted me, I'd stay two years if they wanted me. But I, I didn't know where I was going to be after that. But at the end of two years, I didn't want to go anywhere else. So that's basically some things I think that I want to say about Barnes and about my arrival on the scene. and. I'm looking forward to my classes in the fall. Did you feel like an outsider at all at first? No, because I was the youngest one on the staff. I couldn't, I wasn't old enough to vote when I started teaching and they treated me like a baby. I'm, I mean, I couldn't have asked for better treatment. I, I even had the mumps my first year of teaching and at and over on the block across from the school were houses that belonged to the school district because we had a superintendent who was, who believed in using every resource that he could to make life better for teaching and for children. And he, he bought materials from, I guess, from the Braggs area, from some of the military, what once was a military, installation there. Uh, he bought material and built houses. And when I first came here, that's where I lived. I lived in a, in a duplex and Joe and Andy lived in a duplex around the corner and the one on the corner was designated for coaches. Football coach lived there. And then he, he had the TNI program through the TNI program, they were able to build two more houses on the, uh, the block on Main Street, which is in that same area, but on the other side of the block. And then down on the south side, two houses for administrators. Those have changed, that's changed because in need that didn't dedicate it just to a place for administrators to live, but, and then the one on the corner here sees to be a coach's house and was for any teacher who needed or wanted housing. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven houses that his program started. So that was a drawing card because we didn't have to pay a lot of rent. We paid rent on them, but didn't have to pay a lot. And, that in, and when I decided that I did, in 19, 94, I wasn't sure how much longer I was going to teach. And so I was alert to the fact that the house that I had had my eye on for years was up for sale and the secretary called me. I was in Arkansas visiting with my mother at the time and she called and said, the house you want is up for sale. And I said, you call him the owner, you call the owner and you tell him I have money in hand and I'm coming back to Barnes Hall starting this afternoon. I'll be there as soon as I can get there. And I bought the house and I've been there since. It's my house now, I'm not living in school housing. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about it if I fully retire. I, I have a house of my own. <laughs> you mentioned the TNI program. What does that stand for? Um, technical, Industrial, I okay. guess, is what that is. Okay. It's been around so long, I forgot what it's doing. I know <laughs> that industrial is part of it mm -hmm. because it, it included the shop building. And just where the um, health and fitness building is to the west of us, there was a, a, a 
rock building built by the WPA, which is a works progress works projects association. No, works progress works, administration. Administration. Mm -hmm. They built that building, and and it was a band room. It was an art room, but first it was the the shop and TNI building, and then with when when Tri County Tech began in Bartlesville, that TNI program ceased to be of a real need for our school because they could go to school over there for half of the day and, and get the same kind of thing. But but they didn't go over there soon enough. They built all those houses that <laughs> <laughs> teachers lived in. How old were you when you first started teaching? I was 20. I was 16 when I graduated from high school. Started the university when I was still 16 and finished when I was 20 and came up here the, in the fall after graduation in May. So your undergraduate um, program, you had classes that were suitable for teaching English or for being a um, librarian? Uh, yes, they didn't have a graduate program in library media on the campus, but I could get a minor and in fact, Miss Grider was the one who introduced me to the superintendent because she had worked for him at Westville when she was still teaching in high school. When she she was a Muskogee person and she taught, came to Westville and then he was a superintendent and he'd always come over to visit her and look for teachers on campus. And one day she called me in and she said, I think I found a place for you. And I said, Okay, because I had interviewed with Springdale Schools and was planning to interview with the Little Rock Schools um, and wasn't really, I mean, it was okay. I would have taken the job if that had been what fit me. But when when he came and he described Barnsdall, I wanted to come up here. So mm -hmm. I came to Tulsa. My roommate and I came to Tulsa and my uncle transported us to Barnstall. He was happy because he was, he'd been in Texas company and land management and a lawyer in the company. And he liked to come up here because he'd done that through his working years. So he wanted to show us around. He kept insisting that we should call Pahuska Pahusky. And so that was, I didn't know any better. But when I saw the word, I thought, I think it's Pahuska. And then I came to town, and a few older people around called it Pawhusky. So I thought Uncle Pat really probably knew what he was talking about. <laughs> but anyway, we visited around Barnsdall, and I, I signed my contract that day. I was I was happy. What was your starting salary then? Do you um, remember? He told me twenty four hundred, and then during the summer he said the state came through with some money, and that I would have twenty six hundred, which was. I mean, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. $2,600, that was wonderful. How much was your rent at the well, house? How much was the rent? Uh, well, at the time, no rent. But the IRS caught up with us. Somebody turned us in. <laughs> oh. And we had he had to make some adjustments quickly and start charging rent. But even then, it was a, a pittance. I don't remember what I paid, but almost nothing in comparison to what we have today for, for rent. Mm -hmm. but, and, and it was a nice house. It, and when I had to live with a music teacher, but I'd been in a, a dorm with 156 girls, and I thought I can stand them to live in an apartment with one person. And she was very nice to live with, uh, not too agreeable while she was putting on school programs because she was irritated a lot of the time, but we laughed about that. Uh, but anyway, she left and went to Bay Cone, and I had the apartment by myself after that. So Marcella Greider, was she your advisor in college? Yes, she was the library, um, ad my, my advisor, and and she knew when I when she was that she introduced me to Raymond Reno, she knew it was going to be a good fit, and it was. I remember I was standing up on a ladder shelving some books at the time 
when he was in her office and she brought him out. And I remember looking down at him and thinking, oh, what a good looking Indian you are. <laughs> my, my background is Cherokee and my grandfather was the, I thought the handsomest man I'd ever seen. And, and here was another one who, and that didn't make my decision about coming to Barnesville, but it didn't hurt it any. <laughs> He was very pleasant and, and such a good school man. I, I just, he was, he was good. Did you ever think about leaving Barnstall and teaching somewhere else? I did. I went, I went to Ulaga and, uh, and had a, an interview with the superintendent and that was Partly because my friend from the University of Arkansas, who had he, I, I knew that he was teaching here in the county. I saw him at county teachers' meetings, and then he went to Ulaga. He kept calling me and saying, "There's an English position open," and I said, "I'm not interested. I like what I'm doing." So he kept on until finally I accepted a, an interview. And before I got back to town, the word had reached the superintendent that I was over there having it, and he said, you're not leaving, are you? This was way down the way, I don't know, somewhere in the 80s, I guess. And I said, no, but how did you find out? And he said, well, the superintendent called me to uh, ask about you, and he said, I gave him a good recommendation, but I told him it was gonna be hard for me to turn you loose, and I said, well, you don't need to worry about it because it was a good situation, but I don't want to leave Barnstow. And then Cotty College in Missouri offered me a job, and I I didn't want that. I, I just didn't. I wanted to stay in Barnstow. Mm -hmm. How did teachers dress when you first started teaching? Very professionally. The men often wore ties, not always. Uh, I wore a dress. I don't remember very many times of ever having on uh, dress pants, and I certainly didn't wear jeans. That That is a definite change. I, I, I've, I, I don't remember anybody looking any other way than, and I don't mean that it's unprofessional to dress. I don't mean to leave that impression. I'm simply saying that it was, it was important to be an image before the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I had students who comment on, who have commented on that. Um, my 65 class, they were fun to, to have. They, I remember, them particularly for lots of reasons because they were always eager to then eager to discuss things and I, I was their class sponsor as a junior and you know, lots of things I remember about them but the girls told me they said you used to sit on the desk sometime when we were reading or discussing something and we saw your red petticoat <laughs> I said oh for goodness sake if I'd known that I would have pulled my skirt down and they said oh but it was fun to see that red <laughs> petticoat I'm glad you were happy with it. <laughs> that was, that was a, a, later on, the girl who said that to me later on became an English teacher in the Broken Arrow School, so oh. she, she was uh, observant no. of my red petticoat. <laughs> so, does this library serve the middle school and high school students? Yes. And last year we moved the sixth grade down from the elementary and they became part of our middle school. And, and they, were, they were a set of good readers. I, I enjoyed having them. They were busy, but then that doesn't bother me. I, I expect a certain amount of decorum in the library, but, but their eagerness to find a book didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. Was there any kind of teacher certification testing when you started? No, that came on later. Uh, I had to take Oklahoma history 
and I did it from OSU. That's my, I think my only hours from OSU. I had to take Oklahoma history to be legal in Oklahoma. <laughs> but that was something I, I, I really didn't have to do much reading. I already knew about it. As I told you, my background is Indian. And, and I loved Arkansas history and the overlapping of the facts from Arkansas history and Oklahoma history made that a breeze. I mean, I didn't have any trouble finishing that course. Was the Pledge of Allegiance recited in schools when you started teaching? Yes. Was it daily? Yes. Every day we did that. And uh, I was talking with the principal a few days ago. She asked, said something to me about the student creed, and she wanted to do some work on it and see if we could come up with one that students could feel good about. And I told her we'd had one, and I said, you'll find it in an old handbook someplace. Because the year after... <clears throat> The year after I came, well, I have to have, give you history. When I arrived in Barnesdale, Ethel Briggs was teaching here, and she'd been here for many years. I think she came sometime in the 20s. But she'd been a part of the Barnesdale schools for a number of years and was getting ready to retire. And she was teaching, I think, history classes at that time but she was also the sponsor of student council. And it was an active organization. They did a lot of things. They went to the state conventions, they went to districts, and they did projects around school. And that and play directing, she graciously gave me as a gift. So I, I was still young enough not to fight back, I guess, but. But I became, the second year, I became a student council advisor and I took on a lot of the play directing. But at that time, my student council was very active. They, they met once a month. We, had, we met in the home economics department. We fixed a meal. And often the principal came and ate with us. So we had a good ear there to hear what we needed and what he wanted us to do. But everything we planned, every assembly we planned was centered around the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and the student creed. And if we could manage it, the student song, the school song. That kind of, I, I remained the student council sponsor until 79, I think. And after that, it was kind of changing hands a lot and they sort of got away from using the creed and I told uh, Miss Burns I said I, I know you'll find it and I, and I can say it but I'd rather you'd find it because it's long but the kids knew it and they could recite it and they did uh, now I think that's it's at such length that we might not have a lot of participation. So I encouraged her that if they had a writing of the new creed to shorten it and make it more poignant to the point, get it to something that it's relatable to the students and that they will remember and can say. We're still using, we're still using the, the Pledge of Allegiance every day. That, that happens along with a, a few moments of silence happens at the beginning of fifth hour, which is right after lunch every day. So we haven't lost, we haven't lost the, the way of doing it, we just are doing it a little differently. Mm -hmm. So in the 1960s, there, there was some unrest in our country. The civil rights movement occurred. There was the war in Vietnam. Um, how did those types of historical, as we look back, things affect Barnstall? Very little. I, not much of that filtered down. We, we were aware of it. Our, our students knew. Our teachers handled whatever they needed to about it in their teaching about it. 
but unrest did not touch Barnstall. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it just it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So it was a calm time? Calm, it was a calmer time for, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I won't say there wasn't anything happening. <laughs> Sometimes it, it filtered down with uh, the way that students wanted to dress. And we didn't make a big issue out of it. That, that I think has been to our, our credit here of not, not making an issue about things, just quietly pulling somebody aside and saying, this may not be the best way to look. And that usually takes care of it. Mm -hmm. um, I was a little surprised that um, my seniors used to sell town crier boxes and they were suitcase sized boxes full of knickknacks. And we did it so we could go on a senior trip. And I was coming down the hall one day, headed toward the trash with four of those town crier boxes. They were empty, but I met a yearbook staffer and she said, I want to get a picture of you. And I said, well, wait a minute and we'll set it up so it'll be a good picture. So we acted like I was just burdened <laughs> and the, the selling of the town crier was a burden to me. But carrying those empty boxes was a piece of cake. So she, she took the picture and it appears in the yearbook that, that year. And my dress is awfully short. Oh. I mean, it, it's short. It's, it's equal to some of what I see walking around in the halls now. And I thought, did I actually wear a dress that short? And I thought it was long. I mean, I didn't think I was one of the shorter, shorter skirts in the building. But. <laughs> it's something to laugh about now. <laughs> so in the 1970s, the Title IX legislation passed one of many historical events, I'm sure. That and that passed without, without any stir here. I don't, we might have had somebody who asked some questions, mm -hmm. but no suits, no Mm -hmm. real aggravation to disturb Mr. Gilbert. He, he had a pretty calm life along about then. So that maybe would have affected the girls' sports. Yes. Mm -hmm. We just accommodated mm -hmm. what we needed. I, I don't remember that anything really untoward happened. What sports have, have there been here at the high school? Has that changed over the years? Uh, some in that we've added. Well, when I came, we were we had baseball, basketball, football, and softball. I don't want to forget them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then things changed a little bit. Uh, we've never had facilities where we could have too much of track, but we do have an active track program. Now they just go to a neighboring school and do some of their activity that way. And then what else? That's it. Mm -hmm. We haven't had any other minor sports, just the regular. And our softball teams have been very active through the years. They've been very competitive. Our baseball teams, 1980, I think they were state champion, I think, mm -hmm. 80 or 81, 80 maybe. Somebody will counter me if they see this, but um, <laughs> it was one of the, one or the other of those years. And we've had good years in football. We've had some lean years. It was lean when I came, but we pulled it out and we started winning. We've given Harmony some problems a few times. We, uh, some of the, and. Sperry, we've given them trouble a few times and some other schools. When Andy had ele elementary sports, he coached, he started a little fifth and sixth grade football team and they they played in in a league that was like Tulsa Nine or something like that and they were champions and that played East Central and uh, Collinsville and Union and some of them that have grown by leaps and bounds but but his little boys were very competitive in that, and they, they're proud of themselves. They, there's some pictures and 
some of my albums and some of Andy's stuff that that shows that they they really were competitive. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the potpourri magazine that you started. Was it around yes, 1971? 71. Mm -hmm. Some of my senior girls had been visiting in Bartlesville and discovered they had a, a publication of some sort. And they said, why can't we have one? And I said, well, if you want to get busy and start putting it together, we'll have one. I'll do whatever I can. Our first book was kind of lame, uh, but it reflected what they could do that year. And I have bound copies of all of them. Um, Binding the the potpourri became so expensive that I couldn't do that anymore. So I I used my thermobind and it works beautifully. But and a format hasn't changed much except we now have color. I oh. have lots of photography. Mm -hmm. uh, that little girl was a winner this year of the uh, elementary potpourri award, and she has several things in there. But the I think. Her win goes back to the picture of those two dogs. Oh, yes. Where do you have this printed? Do you print it here in the library? I do it. You do? I work a lot of the spring months. Ooh. Well, I, I start with with uh, Christmas vacation. <clears throat> I do a lot of typing then, mm -hmm. and I just keep a file, and then whenever I can, I start printing pages, and this time uh, our Miss uh, Dr. Bryant's secretary, uh, she's an administrator, of, administrative assistant. She did the printing for me in bulk form, and it really worked. So I'm not, I'm gonna I'm going to remember that instead of trying to do it as I have here in the library. Wow, this is impressive. It's interesting because students want to see the index, they want to know, because being a small town and not a lot of movement, mm -hmm. they can find grandparents working here and go home and ha-ha about it, and <laughs> then I get text messages and Facebook messages about what are you doing to my grandchild, showing them things I've written. <laughs> Were illustrations always part of it? Yes, they were pretty pretty simple at the very beginning, just black and white drawings, but somewhere along the line, I discovered we could have photography, and I, I'm getting, let's see. Oh, that's, yeah, lovely. Oh, that's a student. I have photography from teachers and staff members that I use, and, mm -hmm. and that's added to it also. And, and I have, uh, we've had an active writing program throughout the system this past year and it's the first time that the elementary has really bought into a school-wide writing program and they had writing every week and the said principal brings me those manuscripts after they make their selections of the writer of the week mm -hmm. and I was able to go through it and find things from kindergarten on through fifth grade that I hadn't had quite as much access to, except, you know, some teachers would just give it to me freely, but I have, used to have to go up there and prowl around to find what I needed, but that's made this book more comprehensive of our school. And so it is, it covers all grades then? Yes. Mm -hmm. Kindergarten, pre-K, actually, I have some pre-K things in here. Is there something from every student in there? No, but I had... Oh, I hope I haven't forgotten. 339 entries, I think, that I used in the book. Wow. And that, that some, that, that's not exactly right, but I'm not gonna take time to count it. But you see, some of them have, and if they're in my class, they're apt to be here more because that's part of my class activity is mm -hmm. we do a lot of, of writing creatively which goes along with the writing program and the correctness of expression because that's what I want from them. I, I don't want them to be burdened 
Mm -hmm. with a grammar book. I want them to be able to express themselves in a way they can be understood. But we can do that with a poem, mm -hmm. and and they like that. And 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 I frequently stop action, and we do well. Since I've opened it here, we read Poe's uh, "The Mask of the Red Death," and they designed a glass window color. Uh, I bought uh, anyway a window mm -hmm. for each of the rooms in in his story, and. Those those turned out very 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 wonderful. We can hold that up a little. There we go. Yeah, yeah, that's very nice. So, do the students um, have to? Do they get them freely? No. We sell them for five dollars. Oh, we started in 1971 selling them for two dollars, mm -hmm. and the school was basically f paying for the paper and the mimeograph. Bad word, <laughs> mimeograph have ink that we used, but the five dollars will usually cover the expense I need for cover mm -hmm. stock and some things. But this school still is supplying the basics of finance for it and, and it's worthwhile. Mm -hmm. it, it's good for the writing program and they are so proud of when they see something in there. Uh, high school students are a little more reserved about their euphoria they have but I've had some come in and say, oh Miss Lope, Miss Lope, you put something for me in my book. I said, you wrote something or I couldn't have put it in the book. <laughs> but they, well, they are it's excited. It's nice, nice quality paper too. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So, when you think back to the 1980s, let's see, that was uh, when you went to Ulaga and talked to them. I think it, let's see, no, it may have been in the, the 70s because okay. I'm thinking about who the superintendent was. I've had 22 different superintendents. <laughs> and that many principals are more. Uh -huh. uh, last night I thought she's probably going to ask me that question today about how, how many superintendents so I, I can easily name those to myself but I, I kind of lost track somewhere and I think I missed some but I did get above 20 for principals. <coughs> the, print, the superintendent I have now, there's a, a fun story with that. She graduated from high school in 91 and at that time, I was the principal. I had a five and a half year stint as the principal. And I, that was during my time. And she ended up with needing a, a class to have graduate for graduate credit. And so I said, well, how about if I do, if I supervise you and I, I'm I'm your teacher for uh, world literature, which I'm certified in. And I said, I will just send you to the library and you read. And except for the times I called her into my office and we had discussions about books she'd read, I, I never had to worry about where she was. She was down there, she loved to read. Mm -hmm. And she went to the library and on the hour designated for her time and she read Jane Eyre, she read Wuthering Heights, she read this, that, and you know, things that I wanted her to read and would have read anything that I suggested. We were talking about that just a few days ago. But anyway, graduation time came and the seniors filled out their, their fun stuff for senior day. And when it came to the class prophecy, somebody said, Sarah Bruton is, at 20, well, 20 years now, she has come back to the high school. She has taken Miss Logue's job as the principal and blah, blah, blah. Well, that was funny to everybody in the audience that she was going to take my job. <laughs> well, guess what? Sarah became a teacher. She came through, went for a few years, ended up at the elementary school for a time. And then she came to the high school and the principal's job opened up and she was hired 
we laughed about that. By that time, she was a Sarah Bryant and had twin boys that I had in my was having in my class at the same time. And, and then she has a, a daughter who graduated this year. And then from that, she became, she has her doctorate. She's Dr. Bryant, and she is now our superintendent. Oh. And I'm so proud of her. Oh, what a great story, yeah. And I'm proud of every, there's a, a young lady at the elementary school who also has her doctorate. And she was one of my students after we opened the library, she sat right over there at that table and her eyes on me all the time. And she said many times, thank you for all you did in helping me get where, you, where I am today. Her husband is the football coach. Mm -hmm. And I, there are five teachers, I believe I'm correct, five teachers in this building who have been my students, including Sarah, I think. Mm -hmm. so, but that's, that's what has made 67 years of my life be worthwhile, mm -hmm. seeing people succeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned a young man to you, and I wanted, these are his hands. Oh. It's on the Cowboy Journal. Somewhere there's an article about him. I probably can't open to it, and I won't take time if I can't, but uh, his mother is the administrative assistant to Dr. Bryant, oh. and she gives me, keeps me clued in. He's taken a job, she just told me this morning, the Kansas Council of something, and he's now graduated. I, I'm sorry, she'll see this and say, you can't remember while you get down the hall. Here. I, I, I actually looked him up. When, oh, it's, uh, this is his article. Yeah. He wrote this. Oh, okay. About that gentleman. About that. Mm -hmm. And there's this. Chance McGill. Yeah, Chance McGill. Mm -hmm. His brother graduated before him, and he has a job in Tulsa. She said some kind of a, a distribution person who who knew about everything, oil and gas, and all that stuff that goes the transmission across the United States goes through his computer. So right. they're they're very very good students. People that you need to be proud of an hour at OSU. Mm -hmm. Another student that I'm exceedingly proud of is Rear Admiral Thomas Hall, who also was uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense under the younger Bush. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, he, I, we're in close contact. He calls me, he and Barbara live in, in Florida now since he's retired, but in fact, 8th Street down here that in front of the school is also named Admiral Thomas Hall Avenue, I think. Oh, that's nice. He, he started his education at OSU and finally decided it's time for me to try for the Naval Academy. And, and he packed his clothes in a cardboard suitcase and I hitchhiked whatever way he could to get to the Naval Academy. Hmm. And sheer determination and the will of someone who was a learner from the very beginning. He, his story is kind of outlined there about who he, who he was and is. And he's still extre extremely proud of his roots here and gives Joe Gilbert and me a lot of credit for pushing him and he, he keeps mentioning and I don't remember this but I haven't told him that but he keeps mentioning a scholarship for two hundred dollars that I hounded him to fill out the material the the forms on for OSU mm -hmm. and he got he got the two hundred dollars and mm -hmm. he said I, I, I couldn't have gone if I hadn't gotten that two hundred dollars see mm -hmm. we just didn't have the money mm -hmm. But he's now that right. these are just a few. Mm -hmm. I could I can name somebody in almost any profession that you would mention that has distinguished themselves. College professors, doctors, lawyers, mm -hmm. up and down the scale that have graduated from Barnesville. I read that there's an annual Big Heart celebration in yes. Barnesville. Do a lot of the former residents or students come back for oh, that? Oh, yes. 
has it's changed a little bit <clears throat> because some of the the older persons who planned it have they, they don't have the energy or the time anymore just like Tom he doesn't feel like coming back he had to miss this time because he had some kind of sort of back ailment that he just didn't think traveling was a good idea and so those people have turned it over to a younger group and they've they've taken a different spin but it was fun mm -hmm. it was it was a new kind of a big heart day and they they didn't come to the high school for their alumni meeting but they had some sort of an alumni meeting at the the pizza place downtown oh. which served as a meeting for people but Jane and I walked the the streets that day and and I attended quite by accident. I, I had been invited to the 68th uh, class meeting at the Christian church. And I said, Jane, let's go over to the church. It's cooler over there than it is here. She said, okay, I think that's a good idea, Miss Jane, but didn't tell me what was in store for me. But when I got over there, I was the program. Oh. One of the, I think the young man who did it was president of the class, but he, he had five pages of material gathered on me and brought things out I'd forgotten about. But And anyway, they, they would have been sorely disappointed and they had her prime to get me down there, but I didn't know that. But she, she did a good job of getting me to the church. What is Jane's last name? Javine. How's it spelled? J-A-V-I-N-E. Her daughter-in-law is one of our teachers and the mother of the, the child, I mean, the grandmother of the child who won the Potpourri Award this year with the dogs. I've had, I had Jane and Dale in class. I had both of their children and I've had all of their grandchildren. Um, and I haven't had great grandchildren yet, except they call me Mimi. Well, Miss Alice, that's, it's a family thing, but. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the 1990s, many school librarians were expected to lead the way in implementing computers and technology in schools. Talk about that a little bit. Was that how it was here? My knowledge of a, com I'm going to start with my knowledge of a computer was very slim. To begin with, I was excited beyond words when two of my boys programmed a little T&I with a train and they made it go hoot, hoot, hoot around through the library and I was so excited and they were, they were laughing at, all over the place because they had made Miss Logue so, so happy with their hooting train. But I, I was determined to learn and I learned on an Apple computer and I started doing my, some of my library work on that, cataloging books, I mean, doing catalog cards and so on. So I, to me, I was a leader in the world because I knew how to use a, a computer to do my catalog cards. And then the next step in my computer life was in the nest happened in the 90s was doing my yearbook on that because for from 1994 until just recently I was a yearbook sponsor and we what I had done with scissors and glue and and a ruler was now done on a screen in front of me and it was almost more than I could believe I could shape those pictures and I didn't have to use a, a scropper to get any kind of ratio into my book. So outside of that, just having standalone computers in the library is about all contribution I had. But it was, it was significant because we had a lab and then we had two computer labs and those were coming alive. And, and then what little effort that I provided in the library and that's why that corner table is back there and I have my eyes on to do some reconstruction because now that we're using chromes I don't need the standalones and so we just don't have that. Do all of the students have chromes? Yes. They do. How was that funded? 
friends. local local expense, I guess. Oh. Well, she may have had some funds I wasn't mm -hmm. aware of, but we're making some changes in it this time. Last year they had them and they were responsible for them, and not very responsible. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I had to have some lessons in how do you treat a computer in my class with older kids. And I can imagine what was happening in the middle school. But every student had had his own Chrome and they were responsible to Miss Bobby for that. And they the, come to class without a charger. And for a time I had a cord running all over the room because they'd come in here without it being charged and that was the law. You'd have to be ready to do the work because their assignments to me, their essays, their work that I give them an actual grade on, they do do that way. Mm -hmm. So in looking at all the pros and cons, they've decided to go now to a Chrome library so that I will have enough Chromes here for the maximum number of students that I have in, in my classes and then things will change. They will not be abusive to their computers. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that, that I think is a good change. Mm -hmm. that, did, did that in any way answer your question? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so do you teach the, how many classes do you teach? I teach two. I have um, this, I, I will have an AP, which is a combination this year of 10, 11, and 12, because our enrollment's small enough. And then when you take into consideration that by the time they, my sophomores leaving class have now gone to concurrent. And so they'll be, I don't know where they're choosing to go, whether they go to Harmony, there's a unit there where they go to TC, TC, T, U, whatever, Tulsa, uh, Tulsa Tech. Tulsa College, anyway, that's where some of them go. Some go to RSU, and that may be Harmony, I don't know. Mm -hmm. that, when they're gone, I, I'll let them worry about that. Mm -hmm. But when they feel comfortable and their grades are, are okay, then they go on. Oh. I was just reading something. Uh, before I came this morning, I picked up the Bartlesville magazine that featured me in 2020, and uh, I had, quoted one of my students who came bouncing in one day and said, oh, Miss Logue, Miss Logue, Barnesdale students know the answers to the questions and the others don't. And I said, are you bragging on yourself? And well, yes, I knew the answers. And I said, I, I gave some answers. And I said, well, that's good. <laughs> but then uh, I, I lost my train of thought. But, but anyway, one more class I have, which will be an honors class of, of total ninth graders just mm -hmm. and I'm looking forward to it last year I had two wonderful classes just super you teach the classes here yes in the in library, the library. Mm -hmm. and uh, that creates a problem sometimes when I need to have people come in but as long as the teachers accompany them and maintain control there's no problem mm -hmm. and the checkout is so easy now since we're automated that I Thanks to OSU, I called somebody and said, what company am I to use? And they said, Library World, and that's the way I went. And, and I've been so happy with that company. They, they answer all my silly questions. Huh. But, uh, so they are the uh, system that you use for the books? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Teachers are oriented to the OPAC that's in that, and they, some of them are very good about having their students do a search and find before they come down here so they're ready and they can go directly to the shelf. Mm -hmm. And they're schooled at the elementary with using the Dewey Decimal System, so I don't have to worry about that. They mm -hmm. already know. I, I did mourn the loss of my card catalog, and you're gonna laugh when I tell you this, but I like the way it smelled. Those cards smell good to me. And people say, you like those dusty old cards? I said, yes, they represent a lot of my life. But I had to get rid of that. And, um, but just for room's sake, I think if I hadn't needed the shelf space, I would have kept the card catalog. Let's talk about some different um, 
aspects of education. Um, was special education offered when you started teaching? I'm not sure when that. Uh, if not the along. first year, very soon after. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to visualize who the first special ed teacher was, but it would have been, let's see, I was here starting 55, 56. Before 60, I'm pretty sure we had a, a full, oh, I'm, oh yes, I know we did. Mm -hmm. By 1960, we had special education. Mm -hmm. In what ways has that changed over the years? Well, they have some very valuable input. Um, it isn't often, of course, with what I teach, I don't usually have any need to discuss anything with them unless it's some sort of a, a disadvantage that has to do with like, maybe they are, have asthma or something and they require some special attention. But through the years, I can think back when I, I really did use them, back mm -hmm. when, when I had a different configuration of classes, when mine were just regular English classes with no distinction as to, eight. we started the AP program in 2000. My first class was 2000, 2001. And after that, I, I haven't had a lot of really personal contact with them, but I'm aware of the good that, that they do with those students, it's mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then the gifted and talented program. Oh yes, we're active with there. Janice is Janice Javine is uh, not the same Javine you have on your paper, but the one who teaches here. She's our program director, and I'm on the pro. I'm on the committee, and we do a lot of, of good things. My potpourri is listed as a as part of that, and uh, they they we have a very active art department. Uh, I'm thinking of things we do with Gifted. I know they took some trips. They went to the, uh, uh, this won't be the right term for it, but it's a Jewish museum in Tulsa. It's got another name. I know what you're talking but about. They, the kids came back from that just, they were so excited about what they had. And they, they go to Philbert sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I don't know, and of course, they support any of our AP programs in, in any way that they can. Mm -hmm. But I have several, several of my students who are, who are coming up sophomores are, in, are listed as gifted and in several different ways. I have them in leadership and, and in art, music. They're, when they take one of their trips, I have, sometimes I have two people left. <laughs> Okay, I, I think I remember alternative education starting in the 1990s. Um, they had, they actually had their own um, space at the high school where I was teaching, where the students went and they learned there because they were having difficulties at the main high school. Um, I remember when I was principal, of being involved with that because I was able to outfit a lab with computers uh, in uh, connection with Caney Valley Schools. We pooled our resources, wrote the grant, and we shared a teacher. She taught over there in the mornings and came here in the afternoon. And that was money that we used through Alternative Ed. Now, the way it is appears in our school is Janice has um, online classes for for some of those persons who need to do recovery credits mm -hmm. or just need something that the regular class day does not provide for them. Don't ask me what the name of the program is. I, I can't tell you, but it but I knew she, I know she has students during the day with in under that guise. Mm -hmm. And then it seems like homeschooling and charter schools came after alternative education. Um, is there any of that around here? We do have some students who are homeschooled, mm -hmm. and sometimes they come back into the system, and I assume they're test they do testing on them. I, I'm sure they do. But we've had some re-enter, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But I do know that in our district, we do have some homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the word charter school, uh, I don't think we don't even mention that around here. Mm -hmm. Virtual education, that's the one I think that Janice, okay. I think that virtual programs is what hers is listed under. In the late 1980s, there was a walkout of Oklahoma teachers. Did that affect this area too? We we went when it was the trip to Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. In fact, Jane and I went, she was telling her last night that I was doing this interview with you. And I said, and that reminds me, I ran onto a picture that when I was going through some boxes of things that needed to be tossed. And I said, I, I don't know if I gave it to you or if I tossed it. And she said, you didn't throw my picture away. And I said, well, it was mainly because you were standing there looking up at me while I was looking at a microphone. Channel 9, is that Oklahoma City? Yes. He walked up to Jane and said, "Could you? would you like to talk about something? And she said, no, I won't, but she will. Here I am. What am I going to say? So I said something. Evidently, it was all right. He went on his way. But that's somebody grabbed a picture of that while we. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we did go to Oklahoma City mm -hmm. <coughs> on more than one occasion. Then in 2018, there was another walkout. Um, that led to the first raise for teachers in nearly a decade. I did not go. I don't know if any of our teachers did or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was teaching when the bombing occurred at Oklahoma City, so that's mm -hmm. an event that stands out, a historical event. Um, during my time as a teacher, what are some historical events that stand out to you? President Kennedy's assassination. I was down the North Hall in room eight, I had a student teacher with me, and she was sitting on a, a stool, and she was expecting her first child at the time. She was sitting back there on a stool, and Mr. Culver came on the intercom and made this announcement to us. And I saw Lynn Kay just, and I thought, she's gonna fall off that stool. So I walked back there, and she said she wasn't in as bad a condition as I thought she was. She said, I was a, in charge. And I said, well, you didn't look like you were in charge. But that affected our school system a lot. Our students were grief stricken. They couldn't take their eyes off the televisions when they were at home. And I don't remember, see, it seems like we didn't have classes one day. I don't know, but it seems like we didn't have. And then I remember in the library that I was in before I came to this site, when the bombing happened. No, 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 that's the Twin Towers time. The Oklahoma City bombing. I don't remember where I was then. then I'm sh That was what, 94? 90, 94, 90, I think, 90, 90. Twin Towers happened just before we moved up here. 2009, 10, something. Anyway, I don't want to be quoted on that one. Mm -hmm. But anyway, my library assistant was sitting back at her desk and and she was waving to me like this. And I went back, she had the television on behind her. And she said, they just bombed the, the Twin Towers in, the, in New York City. And that created a stir, but, and, and students reacted to it, but nothing compared to what I saw in 1973, whenever, 63, mm -hmm. President Kennedy was assassinated. Mm -hmm. Have you been a member of professional organizations for teachers? I have current? been in the past, I am not right now, but I have been in the past a member of OEA. Mm -hmm. In fact, at one time, when Weldon Davis was head of the OEA, he appointed me to a legal aspects committee of some sort, and I had to read 
of documents when teachers were you know, having a lawsuit against them. He would send me the material and then I had to go down there. Uh, now my only claim to fame was I made the State Department of Education book. My name is in there in that <laughs> years that I served. But um, that's basically the only organizations I belong to. When you went back to school for your master's degree, how did you do that? Were you teaching during that time still? The University of Arkansas offered two semesters in the summer, mm -hmm. two short sessions, and I was able to go two summers and a half and, and did my master's that way. And I stayed with mother, mm -hmm. which is 28 miles from the university. I drove back and forth. So what is your master's degree in? It's in education, but they did something kind of peculiar with me. More of my hours were in English. I don't know why I didn't choose to go to get a an English master's. I don't know. I think I was frightened. Okay. Now I wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Now I just march right in there. But I did. I had. I don't know exactly how many hours. There was thirty-two hours required for the master's. But oh, more than. Well, 75% of my hours were in pure English. And then I took a few classes in, in education to satisfy the program. Mm -hmm. It's designated a master's degree in education, but somewhere, something they handed me, it says Master of Education dash English. Oh. And somebody told me, you the only one's ever done this. And I said, well, good, I'm glad I did. But I, I earned that if they put it on there because the, the day we were tested, we, we had to, to go in to a room there in Peabody Hall and they handed us some legal side sheets of paper and a pencil. And I wrote 29 sheets of that legal size paper and the majority of it was done because of a question on to take a, an English novel because one of my one of my classes had been and it was called Nine British Novels and I loved it. Um, but I took, um, I've lost a word. Anyway, the novel I took, I compared it to a Greek drama and I, I fleshed it out that way and followed through on all the phases of the novel that followed the the uh, typical tragic Greek drama. And on a Sunday afternoon after the grades had been posted, my folks and I drove over to the campus. I said, I think my grades might be posted. Let's see if I have a master's degree. And I walked up across the campus and a door opened and Dr. Leo Van Zyck came out. He'd been one of my teachers and I loved him. He was absolutely perfect. And he came out that door and he had his hand stuck out and he grasped my hand and he shook it and he said, that was an absolutely splendid presentation that you made. And I, thought, I went back to the car and I said, I'll never wash my hand again. <laughs> Mother said, I take it you passed. And I said, yes, I did. And how was his last name spelled? Oh, goodness. V A N capital S-C-Y-O-C. S-C-Y-O-C, okay. He was in the English department and and part of my credit hours was a, a it was more than three hour class because we met, we met a long time. And he and, and Mrs. Berry who taught at the Fayetteville High School at the time, they they co were co teachers in this, and they just took us through how to present novels, short stories, poetry, and so on. And I, I came out of there feeling like I was floating. It was a wonderful class, mm -hmm. and I I think he recognized the fact that I think he saw some of what he had done for me 
-hmm. That's why I bragged on what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> did you go through graduation? No, I did not because I was in school up here and it, it was in the winter time and I didn't want to venture to Arkansas in icy weather. Oh. Mother had already done that with her trip <clears throat> to uh, graduation and almost slid off into the ditches trying to get home after graduation, so I just chose not to go. But I was there when I got a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. March across that stadium. You mentioned county teachers meetings earlier, I guess was that pro professional development? We didn't call it that at the time, but it would be about ever so often we would have a meeting either at Fairfax or Hominy, sometimes at Barnesdall, and a meal was provided by the school. Mm -hmm. And every, it, it looked like every teacher in the county was there. Oh. And it was a good meeting. They mm -hmm. provided speakers and work, breakout sessions for us. And that was, a, when, that was my first and second year we did that. And I think they discontinued it. Probably somebody got lazy about fixing meals. But um, it was one you dressed up for. And I remember wearing a hat. Oh. Of all things, in 1955-56, you wore hats when you went places, even to the movie. <laughs> <laughs> what is professional development like now? Um, it's good. I, I don't know who Mrs. Bryant has provided for us now on professional development, but we do most of it at the beginning of you know, the few days right before school starts, mm -hmm. uh, we'll have a active shooter on campus on the, the 31st that we're supposed to participate in. I don't know what, how to do that. I guess I'll wait and find out. But somebody is coming in because she said she'd had several calls from her PD person, so we're gonna have someone. And then sometimes we do it in house some of our people, our guidance counselor or other people do in-house training for certain types of need we have. Mm -hmm. What was it like when the pandemic hit? Oh, Spring of 2020. Busy. I, I made it through without too much complaint. I, most of my students did their work, most of them. I had a few who didn't, but I hounded them unmercifully by text and by email and their parents, I knew their parents, so it was easy to pick up the phone and say, hey, so-and-so's not doing his work. That will, that will change, a mother would tell me, and it did. Mm -hmm. But some people complained a lot about how they, the fact that their students didn't respond the way they needed them to. So I think I was lucky. But again, I have, have students who are, basically have a growth mindset, and that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So the school shut down that spring? Yes. Um, I'm trying to think just how we, we were home a lot during that, the worst of it. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I didn't really, I never really had my students do FaceTime with me. I handled it a different way. Maybe maybe that's one of the reasons I was not complaining because some of them were complaining because they couldn't get their students to do the FaceTime. But I did more of mine with, they could see my raised eyebrow. <laughs> <laughs> so did the students already have their own Chromebook or something? They had their Chromebooks before then. Before the pandemic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they were able to to cue in and do their work. Mm -hmm. But I, I found the Chromes have helped me. I like grading their essays on with a Google Doc. <coughs> they keep I keep a file on them. They have a file, mm -hmm. and uh, I can I can spend an evening giving them lots of one-to-one -one and and they it, it helps whenever mm -hmm. we're revising essays and 
trying to make some changes that'll be for their betterment. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to make any changes in that this year. They're, they, I don't know how. They may have to do more work in the classroom, but that might be a plus with I'm right here over them where I can help if they need me. Mm -hmm. So how did you wind up serving as the principal for those years? The gentleman who was our principal uh, was a fisherman. I hope he's not going to watch this, but he he did. That was one of the things he liked to do, and he wanted in a lake area, and he was offered a job south. Uh, and the board told him that if the superintendent could find someone to uh, a suitable person to fill out the year, that they'd let him go. Well, the superintendent called me in and he said, I'd like you to be the principal for the rest of the year. This was in 1988, 88, 87, 88, 88, 89, I don't know, somewhere along there. Mm -hmm. And so I, w I went home for Christmas and I thought about it and I discussed it with people on the staff that I valued their opinion and decided, okay, for a semester I'll do this because we could find someone coming in who didn't know us, didn't understand what we were trying to do in our school system, so it's better if I do this. And that half year turned into five and a half and would have longer if I hadn't set my feet into the ground and said, I will not go back to school because I was getting along at a time when I might be thinking about retirement. Mm -hmm. I wasn't very old then, but I just didn't want to go back to school then. Mm -hmm. And so I took the eight hours that was required. There were some classes that were absolutely necessary that I hadn't covered in education. So I took the hours that were required of me, and then I just said, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. So they hired somebody else. Mm -hmm. but I, at the time I was a principal, I was still teaching my AP class. I was still supervising the library. And I, I was a busy person. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about diversity a little bit. You mentioned that you have Cherokee ancestry. Yes. Yourself. I my grandfather was Cherokee. Okay. Um, and Barnstall is located in Osage County. There's several native tribes that have headquarters around this area. Um, what kind of diversity do you have here in this community? I don't know what the percentage is, but I know it's heavy Cherokee. Mm -hmm. And you would think it would be heavier Osage, but I mean, and there's a large number of Osage students but it seems to me like the last time I looked at the list that there was it was heavily Cherokee. And that's kind of unfortunate because the line is drawn. Oh, uh, Washington County is in, in the Cherokee Nation, mm -hmm. but Osage County is Osage. Mm -hmm. And so we don't sometimes get money that sometimes the school, that Washington County schools enjoy. But that's... I, I don't know what other tribes are. There are some other tribes that are represented, but since I'm not in the principal's office anymore, I'm not always privy to all that information. Is there other diversity in the community, um, African Americans or yes. Hispanic? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. There's there are several, mm -hmm. and uh, we have. I think we have some Asian American students here also. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's happened in the, oh, I don't remember when our first African-American student, I don't remember, it's been a, a while, but like we'd have one, and then now we have several. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I have had, I have had African-American in my class. Nice. Do you remember when the um, curriculum started changing in ways that would um, help students understand diversity better? I know sometimes it was optional in the 
uh, literature book. There might be um, different uh, different readings, but you didn't have you weren't expected to necessarily teach it. You could choose to, but you didn't have to. But I think that shifted too. Um, that was heavier emphasis on it in the say five or ten years ago. And I don't know, the text we're using in the English department now is, I think the balance is good with diversity. Mm -hmm. In fact, the first two stories in that ninth grade English book, and I used that last year, I'm not a textbook person. I prefer to do it my way, and nobody's complained about it, but we have a lot of collateral reading, up a lot of uh, multi-titles. Multi and I prefer to do mine that way, but I did want to use those. And they were, um, one of them was the story of a young African boy who came to the United States and uh, to create a new life for himself. And it was such a well-written story and they warmed to that. I mean, my students, I don't think they even realized what his nationality was. They were reading for character, mm -hmm. and that made me happy because mm -hmm. that's the way I, I would prefer to read it. I don't want to emphasize the color of a person's skin or that when we're reading. We just don't get into that. It's There's so much more beauty in the person that we can cover that that, uh, that, that story, and then we, we had one about uh, apartheid in South Africa and we compared that to some uh, some folk tales that we had read and and they were reading that again for people for not for races mm -hmm. of people but just people and mm -hmm. their inner traits and how that affected their the way they behaved in the world mm -hmm. In fact, I think that one of those stories took us into Poe's Mask of the Red Death, and I've forgotten what my leap was there, but I was glad I did it because they enjoyed the Mask of the Red Death. They had fun with that and then the art project. I'm, I'm apt to stop right in the middle of a, a unit and say, get your paintbrushes out, we're gonna paint today, because I have learned that I can teach imagery with a paintbrush as well as I can teach it with a pencil. And and when I when I look at their their drawings and their paintings, I can understand whether they're seeing how much detail they put into their essays and the imagery they put into their poetry. Mm -hmm. Are there any particular sayings that you always use with students? Yes. Um, somehow I try to slip in the one that, that's attributed to Benjamin Franklin. And I don't just, I don't make it a point. I just slip it in sometime and hope they realize that that's the reason why we paint some days. He is supposed supposedly said, when um, you tell me, and I forget, you teach me, and I understand, you involve me, and I learn. And I think that involvement that they have with the paintbrush is a lot of learning that you don't need a textbook for. It just, it happens. And then I also like to say to them, and I do this frequently. How do I know what I think until I see what I say? So get busy and tell me something. Mm -hmm. That's okay. E.M. Forster, our British novelist of the 19th century. So I'm always sending out those little things to them To One of my girls a few years ago surreptitiously kept a list of all the aphorisms and the proverbs and the silly sayings that I had in class and those seniors presented that to me in assembly on senior day 
And I said, hey, I need to take issue with a lot of that. And she said, no, Ms. Lowe, you said every one of these. <laughs> you still have that? I have that, <laughs> some, I have that book somewhere. <laughs> I bound it very neatly with some tape and, and dressed it all up in a, what they thought I would be a, approving of. To, but when I read some of those sayings, I think they made some of them up. <laughs> What are your uh, rituals at the beginning of school? My personal? Mm -hmm. Well, day one, I'm just going to talk to them what AP means, and I'm going to talk to my freshmen in the same tone of voice because I always tell them you're, you're an honors class, but as far as I'm concerned, you're advanced placement. So get over it. If, you, if there's anything bothering you, today's the day to cut and run because from now on, it's AP. But I tell them uh, that all the things that I want them to ma maintain about the word AP, m most important is address the prompt. I said, every day we're going to be having something for you to write on. It may be a sentence, it may be a paragraph, and it may be the beginning of an essay, but you're going to have a prompt of some sort that will have you writing. And I'll do some of that and I will talk to them about behavior. I don't, I don't put a lot of rules on them because they're, they're there to be broken. As soon as you hand them a room full of kids a list of rules, they'll start at the bottom and make the list complete by breaking every one of them. So I don't do that. I don't save myself the trouble. The second day, I'm gonna start in where I plan to finish. We're going to begin, I'll start with a review of the writing process. I'm going to open the year with the six blind men and the elephant to show them how everybody sees things in a different way. And then my writing project, my writing, which is a project for the whole year, uh, my writing, we're going to start with the three little pigs and we're gonna look at what, what claim can I make about this? What do I know? How do I know it? And why does it matter? And that will stay with us all year long. They'll hear those, speaking of what do I say over and over again. Every day I will say, what do I know? How do I know it? And why does it matter? And mm -hmm. try to impress upon them, that's not true in English class. That's true in every class you take. And if you will adopt that attitude, you will never be lacking in something to respond to a discussion or a piece of writing. Is that? Yes, that's great. What about your end of school rituals, end of the year? Well, that's busy. Everybody's trying to do something to close out their year. And I'm, we're, I, we'll be under a four day a week again this year, thank goodness. I like the four day week. It makes my classes longer, and I think it's it's been good for our kids. And I know, I, if I'm not wrong, I looked at the schedule, it looks like the four-day week is uh, pushed up to the front. I think that's what she's doing. But anyway. What do you mean by that, pushed up to the front? Well, the first of the year. Oh. See, see we did, last year, I don't know. Any, no, 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 no. The four day week is being held to the last of the year. That's what I said, I'm wrong. <laughs> um, we're having the five day week at the beginning. And, I, and that's good for me because as we get into the last months of the year, they're going to state track meets and they're, they're finishing up softball and they're finishing up baseball. And the art teacher, music teacher needs them in for the program that closes out her year. It's just one interruption out of another, and it's no different in Barnesville than it is anywhere else. But with the four day week at the end, I've had the first part of the year, I hope, to get all of my words said and at least get them where I can finish it up on a four day week. Mm -hmm.
Do you keep a journal or have you ever done any writing to record stories about teaching? Uh, not really. I, I do I do, do some writing. Uh, once in a while I, I give them something for potpourri and, and I always, if I'm asking them to write something, I give them a model that I've done to show them that that I'm willing to torture myself while they're having to do the same thing. And and they like that because then they can try to outdo me, which they often do. They're better writers than I am. And uh, that's the only kind of journaling that I do. I, I do artwork, I'm, I do sketching and painting, and I've got some journals of that. But unlike my mother who filled, she filled two and maybe three journals that I had bought her with stories of her teaching. She started teaching when she was 16 years old, and then she went back and finished high school after that. But she's, in one book, she named every student she had. And I, I don't know if that was after she moved to Bartlesville in the Sterling House, Altera Sterling House, and she didn't want to come and live with me. She said, I'm, I want my own life and you have yours. But I don't know if she did that after she was 90 or she did it before, but it wouldn't have been very much before then. Mm -hmm. Every student she had wow. in 43 years of teaching. Now, she had them in a classroom all day long, which makes some difference because my teaching has been have a group this hour and a group this hour and so on. Mm -hmm. I do have one thing on her. I used to tell her that. Can you tell me where they sat in the classroom? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. Some of them probably. And I said, I can tell you where mine sat. And this is fun on Big Heart Day to meet a, someone downtown and start talking. Where's Mo? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? Well, no, I don't remember that, but do you remember where you sat? No, I do. I remember where you sat. <laughs> and it's so everybody has a some kind of a peculiarity about them, I guess, and that's mine. <laughs> Who are your favorite books and authors to teach? Oh, I like Steinbeck. I will select something from Steinbeck if I can, every time. I like Steinbeck, I like William Faulkner, I like I, Mark Twain, Huckleberry Finn, that's a grand book. Um, I, I, I love The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. The, uh, Macbeth and Hamlet, I don't know, where do you stop when... Yeah, it's... And, and I find there's some good pieces of current literature, and, and I can appreciate it, and I encourage students to read, but any time that I can take them back to a classic and do the same thing with it, I think I'm putting some layers of learning on them that they wouldn't do on their own. Mm -hmm. I had a, a teacher at a college board seminar once say, if you can get them on board ship on the Nelly and you, your heart of darkness will take care of itself. And it was while Mrs. Bryant's twins were in my class, I remember because I can see how they were dressed. I thought, we're gonna start heart of darkness. So I'm gonna do this. And I asked them if they'd like to dress up in some sailor clothes for the next day, and they thought that was fun. These, these were seniors. I think all of them were seniors that year. And, and so I dressed in a, what I thought a deck, deck hand would dress. And that was in a day when I could get down on the floor and be sure that I could get back up. Right now I'm not. <laughs> But we sat back there in that circle that's back behind the chairs, and everybody was dressed properly, and we ate we ate a uh, little goldfish. I brought a big bowl of that, and we ate that, and I started reading to them. And lo and behold, we got on the Nelly, 
and we were ready to go. They, I never had any more trouble engaging them. And one of her twins is, he's working for Phillips Petroleum now, and she and he and his mother often take road trips someplace, and he uh, points out things to her. Miss Logue would appreciate that, and he will quote things from, from class. And he discovered, I, I try to have them read uh, something from dystopian literature sometime during the year, either uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau is a favorite because it's so grisly. But he found, in a bookstore, he found The City of Dr. Moreau. And he said, oh, Mom, look here. Miss Logue has to know about this. You have to tell her about this. <laughs> well, I discovered there's a whole series, the, the, the Daughter of Dr. Moreau and The City of Dr. Moreau and whatever the other one is. And I think somebody's capitalizing on H.G. Wells' his, his uh, notoriety as a dystopian writer. But anyway, I was, I was so pleased that Logan would remember that. And some, some have told me that I have ruined their trip to the, the movie because they're always looking for symbolism instead of paying attention <laughs> to what they paid to see. <laughs> <laughs> book banning has become pretty rampant lately. Did you ever have any book challenges here? I didn't, but we had a challenge. Somebody challenged a separate piece. I never knew why. The superintendent said, uh, we probably should pull that. I said, why? Well, he couldn't answer the question. But I pulled it, and I kept it in a closet until a few years, and we have hardbound copies now that we got with some textbook program. They offered us a chance to buy 50 books along with the program, and that was one of the choices that a teacher made. So I not only have a class set of paperbacks, which I will not throw away, mm -hmm. plus my hardbacks, nothing wrong with that story. Mm -hmm. But that's the only time that I can remember ever. Now, it, that is not to say that a student will not find a word in a book, and I do appreciate that. I mean, I don't, I just thank them grandly and take the book. And if it's something I need to deal with, I do. I don't, I don't approve of four letter words in my books particularly when I have a library that goes from 6 to 12. And most of my readers are on the, the lower end of that. So I'm very careful about trying to see that it's appropriate language. But I don't mind if they find something. They just bring it to me and I deal with it how I see appropriate. Right or wrong, that's the way I'm doing it. So it never becomes a big issue. A lot of times... If we don't make an issue, it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How have cell phones changed how you teach? <laughs> well, we use them in class sometimes, but most of the time, oh, well, my box is not visible. I have a little box that I've put together, which I call their parking place, and when they come in, they're supposed to put their cell phone there. And I, I, I'm usually standing there, and if I want them to use their cell phones, I, uh, I say, you can keep them today because we may be using them. Um, m meaning that I may want them to do some research on their phone while their, their Chrome is uh, occupied with a, a document that they're retorting information on. So uh, it hasn't changed my teaching, and, it, uh, and most, most, um, Classrooms in the building have a, the same kind of thing. They've made the use of shoe, shoe uh, racks, I mean, a hanging mm -hmm. place for your shoes, and they, that's on their door or beside the door. Has social media changed anything about how you teach? No. Mm -hmm. I don't contact my students that way. Mm -hmm. I do ask their permission to text them if I need to. And as I said, I know a lot of their parents and, and I have their cell phone numbers and I, I 
I do contact them that way. I, most of my contact is done through email, though, because that's a safer mode than, than texting, because who knows how your words on a text can be misconstrued. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to say anything in my text that's going to cause me any problem, I hope. Do they have email accounts through the school? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's they email me their <clears throat> their documents, and then I transfer them to their file in graded mode, and then they can pick them up and see what it is and read my comments. Mm -hmm. I have some who I can see them whenever I'm grading their paper. I can see their little icon up there watching. It's always <laughs> funny to me. <laughs> Not all of them do that, but some who, who are pretty interested in what I'm going to say, they'll fall and shadow me while I'm grading. <laughs> Talk about standardized testing in schools. How has that changed over the years? Well, I think with ACT it's better. I think that's that says more, at least about my students. I, I'm able to get a better picture of them when they're tested that way. I think I like that better. It's uh, it's not as it's not as obtrusive as it was at one time. At least I don't feel like they're we're spending as much time out of the class mm -hmm. ten testing as we did a, a way back when. Mm -hmm. Do your students take the, the AP exams? I wish I could say yes with a resounding note, but it's hard to get them. They, they get a message that it's a hard exam, and so they won't try it, even when it's paid for by some fund. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the, the uh, JOM funds or something, Anyway, the, the Indian money sometimes covers it, and sometimes I guess we've had some gifted money that's covered some. But they're afraid, and these same people who are afraid to sit down and take that test and earn possibly three hours credit very easily and make the school some money while they're doing it, they'll go out and do concurrent enrollment and come back and proudly show me an A. Hmm. And that kind of aggravates me at them because mm -hmm. they could at least have saved that three hours for another class. Mm -hmm. But they're hard-headed and so am I. So. <laughs> when it comes to change, what's been the hardest to keep up with? I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Name some things. Do you embrace change? Yes. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, if change does not interfere with me doing what I think I absolutely know they need for not just college, but for whatever, whatever they do in life after they leave high school, if change is going to get that in the way, then I resist it. Mm -hmm. But I pretty much go with the flow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you could go back in time, what would you tell your young self about teaching? Stay to the course and keep a sense of humor and you'll have it made. <laughs> I've always been able to to laugh about things and I encourage my students that I talk to them about different kinds of humor just so they can see that sometimes they're laughing about things that aren't wholesome. But I, I, I tell them it never hurts to laugh at yourself and I said you find me laughing at myself day after day. If I do something silly and you catch it and I hope you do we're gonna laugh about it. I'm not going to be mean to you because you told me I was wrong. I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. If you could change anything about the current education climate in Oklahoma, what would it be? I don't know enough 
about what is happening with our education climate to speak intelligently. I know what I read in the newspapers, but I don't have any firsthand information about that. I just know that I have always done what I was expected to do. And that's the only thing that I can tell you, it, that if I'm told to do something, I will do that. Um, I'm, I may disagree, but as long as I bear the, the title teacher and I accept money for doing a job, I have to do what I am told to do. I'm going to give you an example and it will tell you what I mean. In, in the mid 80s, we had a, a principal come in who, who didn't do a whole lot. He sort of sat and looked straight ahead a lot of the time. But one day he called the staff together and he said, I want you to write lesson plans for me. Well, I already written my lesson plans. I wrote, the, I started writing lesson plans in 1955 because I'd been taught that was a necessary commodity in your teaching, have a lesson plan. And so I had done that semester by semester, not daily plans, but I knew where I was going every day. And I handed those to every principal I had. Here's a copy of my lesson plans. I, I don't know if I was the cause of it, whether he pulled mine out and looked at them and said, I don't have any from anybody else or what. I don't know. I, that's humorous. That's my sense of humor. But anyway, I had given them to two teachers that I admired. They were good teachers came to me and they said, what are you going to do about these lesson plans? And I said, nothing. Mine are already turned in. What? You turned them in? Yes, I did. Day one, when, as soon as we started, I gave, I've done that every year. Well, I know more about teaching it than he does. I'm not turning any lesson plans. I said, fine, that's your decision. But I was told to do that and that's what I'm doing. Now, that's my answer to you about education right now. What I'm told to do, I will do. Mm -hmm. If the time ever comes that I, I can't do that, then I'll have to complete my retirement, which is partial now. Oh. I'm in partial retirement. I'm supposed to be here four hours of the day, but it kind of stretches a little bit. I'm here more of that. Oh. I just have a few more questions. Okay. Okay. In 2021, the Osage County Historical Society honored you as one of Osage County's heroes and legends. Tell me about that award. Well, it scared me whenever I found out that they had me already locked in and there wasn't much I could do about it. No, it was, it was, a, it was such an honor. Uh, I took with me uh, Jane Javine and her daughter and Sarah Bryant they went with me to the to the celebration because I needed support. And I talked to the group of people pretty much the way I have talked to you. I, in fact, some of the things I've said to you today, I used in my presentation to them. Um, it surprised me that someone who was a dyed in the wool Arkansas, your Razorback would be honored in Osage County, Oklahoma. But my years of service to education has all been here, so that's, that's understandable. Sometime I think maybe I'll say to uh, Mr. Drummond, Tentner Drummond, he was on the, the list then. Uh, I'm gonna tell him, I was a legend, I guess you're a hero because <laughs> I've been here longer than you, but. I haven't, I haven't seen him since that night, so I haven't had a chance to tell him that. But I, I really, and I told him that night, I didn't understand. Here, I'm, here I am with a, an elected official. I'm here with a, a, a movie star. He was, that was in absentia. I think he was the, not there. I think he'd already passed away. And, and a cowboy author and a couple of other people, but I didn't see where my place was. But I had students that I didn't know were there. 
who said to me afterwards, Miss Logue, you commanded the audience. I said, I did. And they said, yes, with that raised eyebrow, you did. <laughs> you had us all. And I said, well, I'm glad because I was scared to death while I was standing up there. Anyway, it was an honor. I did you have it. written out no. your speech or notes? No. No. I was afraid to. I was afraid I'd look down and see the wrong thing. Oh. Well, I just spoke off the cuff. And I'm glad I didn't know that those students were there other than the, my, my reserve table of people. I didn't care what they thought. They <laughs> <laughs> so the library was um, dedicated and named in honor of you. The plaques out there, did you know that was going to happen? Uh, no, I didn't know that he had created that plaque. Mm -hmm. Had I known what he was doing, I would have suggested a different picture. Because that <laughs> curly hairdo that I have out there is not really indicative of what I've been for several years. Have you won the Teacher of the Year Award? Several times. Mm -hmm. One funny. A superintendent said one time my name was on the list and he said we'll have to take you off you're a librarian so you're not a teacher i didn't lose my load temper then i just sort of sucked it up uh, that really aggravated me i'm a teacher you're a teacher and i dare anybody to say that a librarian's not a teacher mm -hmm. but i i have i have several framed teacher of the year at my house What do you think are some of the most important skills that teachers need? Well, first they need a solid background in the subject they're teaching. They need that. They need a, the milk of human kindness. They need a sense of humor. And uh, an understanding that they too once were teenage or younger, whatever age they're teaching, and they haven't always had the mindset they have now. And that's an understanding of the age they're teaching. And stick to it if this don't give up. If it doesn't work, find another way to approach it. Don't don't give up because it, your first method fails and have a little fun. Some days get out the paintbrush. It really works. Respect their opinions. I could go on for, for a long time, but that's basically. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's more turnover now than there used to be? A what? Turnover as far as teachers, administrators? I don't see it here. But I think in the overall picture, there's some, maybe a, maybe that's that not being stick to it. If they're, they're giving up before the true picture is played out. Mm -hmm. What do you think about alternative certification? I think in some places it's been very good. We brought some people on staff who have done a good job through that, that program. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't just advocate picking anybody off the street and giving them alternative certification because we can't do any better. But our administrators have been very astute in their selection process and they have not, they've not brought people in just to warm bodies to fill the teacher's chair. Mm -hmm. What's one of your happiest memories of teaching? Oh, goodness. That's so many. I don't know. Things, I think we've... When I get a potpourri finished, and I, I have a picture of me that I, I did some reaching out for donors choose funds this year and and I had thought I'd probably use that one because part of my money was spent on on 
doing some activities for potpourri. And I'm back there at a table holding up the last copy that came through when I had finally, they have the GBC combs in the ones that I sell. I'm holding that one up. And uh, those, are, those are happy moments when you have something going and students have been involved and it all turns out okay. That's a happy moment. Mm -hmm. What about a hardest moment? One of your hardest moments? Losing people that I have taught with for so many years. The three gentlemen I mentioned who were more than teachers to me. That's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard when I lose a student and I can think back through the years of hearing that somebody had had a car accident and didn't survive. That's almost unbearable. What advice do you give to new teachers, if any? Love your students. They know. They know if you love them. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to hug. It's not a huggy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's false. They know if you love them. You can correct them time after time after time if they know that as soon as that's over with you, right back to square one and you've forgotten what happened. How have you, dis if you've had to discipline students, how have you done that? Has that changed? <laughs> yes. <laughs> My first year to teach spanking, paddling, whatever you want to call it, was okay. I had. Down in the basement room, I had a class of 30 eighth graders, and they were busy. They had come to me not expecting what I had to offer, and I was not expecting anything but what I had to offer. I wanted them to learn some English. And I did paddle a few of them. I, I didn't hurt them. I wouldn't abuse anybody, but I, I, I made their genes warm up a little bit. It was 30 boys, and I had 36. I had 30 boys and six girls fill the room. And they would go down to this little fast food on the corner, it was called the Dairy Go Round. They'd go down there and tell the lady at the Dairy Go Round, we got a pretty English teacher, but man, she can, she can hit hard. <laughs> She'd tell me that when I'd show up at the window. And I said, well, I don't think I've killed anybody yet, but yes, I, I can warm their pants a little bit. I didn't, uh, and then something came out of that. Sometime about mid-year, I thought, I'm tired of this. I don't want to go on with this discipline thing. I want class. Mm -hmm. So I told my three young ring leaders, I said, you stay after school this afternoon. You come down to, to the classroom. I want to talk with you. Um, and they looked at each other like, well, here it is. This is the end of the road. And, but they showed up, all three of them. And when they came in, I said, have a seat. I want to talk to you about something. I said, have you, do you think that maybe you'd like to make a slide projector? A slide projector? That's one of those things. And, you know, and I said, yes, but can you hear that? A little bit, faintly. It's okay. <laughs> anyway, I said, I think I can show you how to make one. If you're ready, I'll bring the, the things in tomorrow afternoon and we'll, we'll make one. So I showed them how we take a box and a light bulb and two broomstick handles and a, a thing. And I said, pretty soon, we'll be putting things on the wall. And we did. Mm -hmm. Never had any more trouble out of those three boys. Mm -hmm. I learned a lesson in teacher training right there. It taught myself, involved them, mm -hmm. and I learned. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I started working on others the same way. They weren't the only three. 
And by the end of the year, I had a pretty decent bunch of eighth graders. In fact, right now, they probably tell you I was okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good story too. What do you tell people who may be thinking about teaching as a career? Go for it. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't make a practice of, of preaching that to my classes, but every time I get a chance, I, I will tell somebody, you have, a, you have a knack for teaching. Why don't you think about that? And there's a little lady who's in, right now involved in her, her education plan, and she has decided to go into teaching. She's, she'll make a good teacher, and, and I'm glad that, that she's thinking about that. Mm -hmm. A lot of them have, we've had, we have a lot of teachers that have come out of our school system. Is there anything that I haven't asked that you would like to share? Well, I think you've covered it very well. Well, thank you. I wasn't as scared as I was at the Heroes and Legends banquet because I was a little terrified of this. But Were you? It's been... What, did, well, explain that to me. Well, I just didn't want to say anything that would reflect in any way in a bad light on the Barnesville schools. Oh. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. so I wanted to, and I haven't, I have not put ro rose colored glasses on, I've told you the truth. It hasn't always been a bed of roses. We've had some years whenever I, I was not in good, in good, shape to say anything really good about what was going on, but that leveled out and those people went on their way. And it's it's like when we finish reading The Great Gatsby, it's, it says there are people who go through the world tearing down things and then they leave and let somebody clean up the mess. And you know, that happens in life. Mm -hmm. and, and we've had that happen sometimes, but we were quick to clean it up and get going and, and that just didn't happen. And I think if there are people who have worked with me who see this sometime, they'll they'll be remembering what I'm talking about. They'll know, I don't need to mention any names. Has the number of students held pretty steady? Yes, we lost, in the first year we lost talent uh, pl the city service plant at Talent moved to, to somewhere in Texas, Kilgore, I think. Anyway, they moved their, the installation of that and just left the bare bones there for a while of doing something. But it took families out of our community that it was hard to survive over. I think of maybe about 50 students, I don't know. But, we, we never really regained that, but we've, we've come back and our classes have remained pretty much the same. This senior class, I think we had 18, and that's the smallest class that we had 21 one time, but I think this, this junior, this last senior class is the smallest one. But we've got some bigger classes coming along. In fact, they're making schedules out now and scratching their head about what we're gonna do. Mm -hmm. And we've added some AP programs besides mine. Mm -hmm. We've added AP biology and AP US history. And so that's made some changes that have needed to be addressed, but we'll, we'll get there. That mm -hmm. We'll find a way. Where did you go for the training for AP? I, I did, uh, I've done several short trainings, but the one I did for a week, I went to TU, had Lisa Baker, she was absolutely wonderful. And we formed a friendship that we still, we still text and Facebook back and forth. And she sees something about me, she's sure to tell me she read it. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time and for the interview today. It's been delightful. 
to get to know you a little bit and learn about your career. Um, I don't think I could have lasted as long as you <laughs> with teaching. I did love teaching, but um, but it's been it's been really nice to learn more about your community and your school and the different students you've had and coworkers. And so appreciate well, that. It's been a good. It's been a good ride for me. I've, and I don't know in these last few years if I would have survived if I had not had students. So, mm -hmm. uh, changes in my personal life made things rather difficult for me. But, but uh, it was pleasant to come to school and know that they were smiling at me. So. Do you have siblings? No. No, I grew up on a a farm in Arkansas where I was running up and down the creek banks and trying to be a, a boy for my daddy and a girl for my mother. Did you always want to be a teacher? I think so. I, I um, admired what my mother did. I, she, was, she was the one who introduced me to the Odyssey, but she didn't do it. I was in second grade when she was reading it with her eighth graders part of those five years that we were in that one room school. But I was more interested in what was happening over on the other side of the room with those eighth grade boys than doing my second grade work. And, and she always had something, some kind of a, an activity going. She'd send us out to gather, to gather leaves. And then we did our research in our science book to find out what we'd gathered. And we wrote stories in a in our little notebooks and we did all kinds of things that I think I see myself doing that kind of thing now because that held my interest and it made me want to learn more than than it would if I just read wrote from a textbook and answered the ABCs at the end of the chapter so yeah I think I always wanted to be a teacher mm -hmm. <laughs> have you had to make sacrifices with this as your career? No. No, I have not. Mm -hmm. It's been, and it, basically, I mean, life hadn't always been a perfect, but it's a, it was something I'd choose all over to do all over again. Mm -hmm. Do you have hobbies? You said you paint? Mm -hmm. I paint. Uh, I guess that's, I used to sew, but I don't anymore. That's, mm -hmm. I guess painting is my hobby. Mm -hmm. When did you go to the, um, the half, half time, four hours, is that, is that, what is that called, half retirement? I can't remember when I did that in the last, huh. 2004 or five, somewhere, I've been doing this quite a while. Mm -hmm. I, I figured out that I could do, that, that the school could benefit money-wise by my salary if I just took partial retirement and I could stay at home a little longer in the mornings mm -hmm. and I could leave early. I, I've, I've been very lucky that the last, the seventh hour of the day I have a student assistant, and and it's someone that's trustworthy. And I, from the very beginning, I'm, I don't remember if I could remember the first girl I had. I'd know when I did this, but they lock up, mm -hmm. and lots of times I stay until the end of the day. But I had two last year, and they were perfect help. We did, we laughed and barcoded books, and just had all kinds of fun, and they. And, enjoyed the time with me. I'm hoping I have both of them back again, but um, it, it was a good choice I made. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you.